In the name of Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Agabus. Agabus. Doesn't that sound kind of like those old-timey guns whenever you're watching a Spanish conquistador movie and they get on the ship and sail to the New World and they have a none-too-friendly interaction with the natives who are already here and a battle ensues and they have this thing that looks like a cannon with a funnel at the end of it. That's a blunderbuss. Okay, yeah, you light it, you hold on, and you pray, and boom! Agabus! That's a man's name. Everybody say that together. Agabus. 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 That's probably more times than the name of Agabus has ever been mentioned since he walked the earth. And obscure individual in the New Testament and yet a very vital individual because according to Luke who has written the Acts of the Apostles we get all the way to chapter 11 we'll read about him again when we come to chapter 21 and Agabus is a prophet what in the world is a prophet not the kind of profit you make when you buy and you sell something and make a little extra money. You know, you buy it for 10 and sell it for 15. You buy low, you sell high. That's, that's profit, isn't it? Something that we all enjoy. But what is a biblical profit? If I were to ask you to name a prophet of the Old Testament, could you do it? Can anybody name a prophet out of the Old Testament? Just one prophet. Jeremiah, very good. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Malachi, Jonah. Just a few prophets recorded in the Old Testament. And notice their role in society. God comes to them. God gives them a message. And inevitably that message is what? Repent. Turn to God. Stay away from your wayward ways. Get off that wide road that leads to perdition and return to the way of the living God. Remember Jonah. God comes to Jonah and says you need to go to Nineveh and preach against the wickedness of that great city. And what does Jonah do? Yes, sir. And he gets on a boat and he sails all the way to Nineveh, correct? No, God says go this way and Jonah heads this way. So much so that God has to draft him in a very vivid and memorable way. Jonah in the storm cast over the side of the boat sinks down into the depths of the sea. A whale comes along and swallows him up and he is in the belly of that whale for how many days? Three days. Three days, three days and three nights. And what do you do when you're in the belly of a whale? You pray. Yeah, you pray. I remember when I was a little boy, those of you who remember years ago within the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, the whole Simonex controversy where there were certain people within our Senate who were misguided and said that there are parts of the Bible that are myths and Babels, and finally there was a division within our beloved synod to where the people who did not believe the word of God left our synod and formed their own gathering. And my dad and my uncle were talking about this. And my uncle said, if God says Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he could have created a parlor in the belly of the whale for him to be in. And I was a little boy. And I was sitting there listening to these two individuals. And I asked my uncle and my dad, what's a parlor? And my dad looked at me and he said, it's a nice place to sit. And so in my mind, I kind of imagined Jonah there in the belly of the whale sitting in a lazy boy recliner. <laughs> yeah. God watched over Jonah. God kept Jonah safe. God gave Jonah time to think and to contemplate and to meditate upon his decision. And then God delivered Jonah. And now Jonah was a believer. 
Jonah made tracks and made his way all the way to the city of Nineveh. There he preached in 40 days. If you do not repent, if you do not turn from your wickedness, if you do not turn to the one true living God, God will obliterate this city and this nation from the face of the earth. And here's the miracle. Now, I truly believe, I truly believe that Jonah was in the heart of the whale, the belly of the whale. I believe that. But we get hung up on that. The true miracle that happens in the book of Jonah is that Jonah preaches one sermon and the entire town converts. The entire city believes the word of Jonah. See the power of the word. See the power of the word. I don't know how many conversations I've had with people on evangelism, on sharing the good word, on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they say, you know what, Pastor? I can't do that. I, I, I'm shy. I'm timid. I don't know my Bible well enough. I mean, you know, what if I get tongue-tied or what if I say the wrong thing? What if they back me into a corner? It is not your responsibility to convert an individual to Christ. It is not not your job. Not my job either. Let's all look. Okay, yeah, there we go. Got that out of our system. <laughs> it's the job of the Holy Spirit. Your job is to share the Word. Your job is to share the message of Jesus Christ. That's my job too. It's the job of every single Christian to share the good news. Evangelism is easy. It's incredibly easy. If you go to the theater and watch a really good movie and you walk out and you're like, wow, man, that was a fantastic movie. I really enjoyed it. It was worth every penny. And you see me and you stop and you say, Pastor, you got to go see this movie. It was fabulous. That's evangelism. You go to a restaurant and you have a delicious dinner. You know, the steak is nice and the baked potato is loaded and it's one of them great big baked potatoes and the service was fabulous and the price wasn't too bad. What are you going to do? You're going to tell all your friends, hey, you need to go to this restaurant. They treat you right. It's not expensive. The food is delicious. Check it out. That's evangelism. Where are you going to spend eternity? Where are you going to go after you die? Hey, I know a great place. I know a fabulous place. I know a fantastic place. It's called heaven. It's called paradise. And how do you get there? Through Jesus Christ. John 14, chapter 6. I've reiterated that time and time and time again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through me. What does Jesus say in John chapter 14? I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you to be with me. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. That is good news. And all you have to do is share the news. How many of you have seen the new movie Top Gun with Tom Cruise? Raise your hand. You seen it? Was it a good movie? Was it a fantastic movie? Would you encourage me to go see that movie? Yeah, I don't know how many people. Pastor, you got to see this movie. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't had time to go to the theater. And uh, I don't know if I want to spend, what is it, 25 bucks? Wow, ouch. I'll wait till it comes out on DVD. Or I'll wait until it's one of those free movies on Prime Movie. Simply because I haven't seen it yet does not negate the fact that you think it was good. Likewise, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's the trap we fall into, and this is a trap laid by the devil. I guarantee you. We finally work up the courage. We finally, you know, we finally get the wherewithal. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Pastor keeps telling me to do it, and I'm going to do it. And we go to that person that does not believe in Christ, and we share the good news with them. And they don't go to church. The clouds don't break open and no lightning bolt comes down. They don't suddenly confess Christ as their Savior. And we think, well, I failed that one. Not true. Not true. 
Have you ever planted a garden, flower garden, vegetable garden, any kind of a garden? How many of you have tried to plant a garden? Raise your hand. How many of you were totally successful every single time? You put that seed in the ground, you cover it up, fill a little water on it, and you wait for it to sprout and break through the earth. And sometimes you plant them and they grow, and sometimes you plant them and they don't grow. Case in point, last year, <laughs> and this has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon today. <laughs> Imagine that. Last year I was, I was actually cleaning out my garage. Can you believe that? Yeah, I got in there and thought, you know, this place is a mess, and I started tidying and moving and putting things away and got my workbench kind of cleared up. And what do I find? Lo and behold, I look down, and there's a package of tomato seeds. And I looked at the date on the tomato seeds, and it said 2012. Yeah, these things have been here a long time. I was going to throw them in the trash. There's no way these things are any good anymore. Wait a minute. What if I just threw them on the dirt? And so I went in the corner of my backyard and I opened up the package and I just sprinkled them around and covered them up. Well, good luck. Every single one of those seeds sprouted. And all last year, they were little cherry tomatoes. Those were the most delicious tomatoes I've ever eaten in my life. It was like eating candy. What did I do to make it happen? I took a chance. I spread the seed. And I left the results to God. And God said, okay, isn't that the very thing he encourages us to do in the Bible? Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, says the Lord. It will accomplish the thing for which I have sent it. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. Imagine if I had opened up that little package of tomato seeds and sprinkled them out on the ground and then moved away. Would my absence have hindered the tomatoes from growing? If I'd moved to another town and somebody else moved into my house and they went out in the backyard, hey, tomatoes! Maybe you won't get to see the results of your labor. Maybe you won't get to see the results of you planting that seed. But somebody else will. Maybe it takes somebody else and another person. Maybe they have to chat with another individual. Maybe they pick up a, a religious tract and start reading that and saying, you know, I, I remember when so-and-so was talking to me about this. Maybe they have a, a, you know, they hit a bump in the road in their life. Maybe they're struggling and, and things aren't going right and you've told them to call out to Jesus Christ in their trouble. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me, says the Bible. And they remember that. And they, Lord, I don't know you. I don't know a lot about you. But I've heard your name. And I've heard your word. And that friend, that relative, that loved one, they shared your word. Lord, I don't even know how to pray, but deliver me from this. And God says, okay. That, my friends, is how that seed sprouts and grows. Plant the seed. And maybe you won't see the results until you get to paradise. And maybe one day you'll be walking around there in heaven on those golden streets and that individual will walk up to you and say, Hey, remember that day we had that chat? Remember when you took the time to sit down with me and share with me the precious gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what got this going. Because you trusted the Word of God. You trusted the power of the Holy Spirit to do His work. We're here in heaven together today. I'm going to save this sermon for next week. Okay? Agabus. Here, I'll give you a little, a little tidbit. Agabus, which means 
the Father's joy. Think about that during the week, my friends. And all God's people say, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.